While everyone's focused on the release of Google Gemini, quietly in the background, Mistral releases their own open source model. And the way it got released is through peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Remember that? It's basically how we all used to pirate things back in the days. Music, videos, video games, etc. Now, of course, everyone has stopped since then, right? No one's doing that anymore. But it's neat that they're releasing it through a magnet link. So, you know, you download a P2P, peer-to-peer -peer network, BitTorrent, or whatever. The reason this model is important is because it seems like it's no longer OpenAI's world. There isn't just one model, GPT-4, that is the reigning king. There seems to be more and more competitors showing up. Maybe they're not quite there yet, but they're definitely catching up, including open source models. Now, open source models are obviously a big deal. If you're running your own locally, it has several advantages. You can see if it has censorship or bias, you can correct for that. No one can take it away from you. Nobody can flip the off switch and disconnect you from it. You can't get kicked off the platform that allows you to use it. You don't have to pay anybody as long as you have enough computer power to run it. You're able to do whatever you want with it from writing code to answering questions. And the hope that eventually, as we see these things develop, they're going to start being able to do much more. They're going to be able to automate portions of your business, do customer service, navigate the web, etc. Basically do the autonomous AI agent things that we are all kind of looking forward to them being able to do. As long as the model is controlled by a corporation, somebody else, some third party, it's never fully yours. Somebody can always take it away. Somebody can censor it. Somebody can change it to be more politically aligned with whatever their vision is. The EU already passed a bunch of laws about what you can and cannot do when you're developing these models. In essence, they're regulating what kind of math you're allowed to do. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these models, they're kind of just, well, math. Anyways, the big point here is that this Mistral model does very well. Several people have commented how, according to their testing, it seems like it's going to be better than GPT 3.5, meaning that open source models are less than a year behind kind of what we're seeing out there today. In this video, let's take a look at how well this thing performs at some of the benchmark tests. But most importantly, let's see if we can figure out why it did so well, because there might be a little trick that it used. There's a certain piece of architecture that it used that is very effective, and that is MOE, Mixture of Experts. So here's a paper from March 2014, learning factored representations in a deep mixture of experts. And this is out of Google, NYU. And notice one of the names on here, Ilya Sutskever, or Ilya Sutskever, as I think a lot of people pronounce that. So it's saying here, mixture of experts combine the outputs of several expert networks, each of which specializes in a different part of the input space. This is achieved by training a gating network that maps each input to a distribution over the experts. Such models show promise for building larger networks that are still cheap to compute at test time and more parallelizable at training time. In this work, we extend the mixture of experts to a stacked model. So kind of a simple way to understand what that looks like is here's your input. Here's your question. Like, tell me a joke or how do you code this game or help me with Excel? And that hits a gating network that kind of classifies what kind of a request that is. And so what mixture of experts is, is basically you can think of these models like GPT-4, not as one model, but several. In the case of GPT-4, I believe, if I recall correctly, they were guessing that it's 16 different sort of models. I don't know the exact number because I don't believe they've ever published that information. But in this Mistral model, for example, as you can see here, this 8E, that's what that's referring to, eight experts. So it's almost like eight building blocks of this model combined into one 7 billion parameter model. So you have your expert one, two, three, et cetera, however many experts you have on various different subjects. Now, what type of experts can you have in these models, for example? You can have one that's responsible for language output. You can have a domain specific expert that maybe deals with medicine specifically or finance. You can have a task related expert. So for example, one that summarizes text, one that analyzes sentiment, for example. You can have one expert that deals specifically with data management or file storage or, or things like that. So when you ask a question, this gating network figures out which experts to bring in to answer that question. Then those experts, those sort of sub models almost, they figure out how to answer it. And then that same gating network kind of figures out how to organize that information. And then that's where you get your answer, the output. So here's a post by Dr. Jim Fan. So he's saying benchmark results of Mistral 
mixture of experts, MOE, are out. And he's basically giving credibility to Francis, the person that posted this. He's saying, I trust this person with these numbers. And he's saying, now extrapolate this to a 34 billion model that has eight experts or a 100 billion model that has eight experts. These models that Mistral has probably already developed internally. I think they may be at GBT 3.5 to 3.7 level. And other people have commented this as well. It's it's seeming like they're getting past GPT 3.5. They're better than GPT 3.5 with an open source model. So here are those results. So Yi is the large Chinese model, DeepSeek 67B by a quant trading company, Llama 2, 7 billion parameter. As you can see, it does very well. It beats out Llama in a few different measures, and it's similar in others. So here on the MMLU, it's getting 71.73. Gemini Ultra recently announced that he did 90.04, although some people are questioning the approach, the structure with which they did it, because most of these other ones, they tend to do few shot or five shot approach. So GPT-4 was the undisputed champion for quite a bit at 86. So it looks like here, Gemini Pro at five shot. So this is this would be something like Bard. What, what Bard is running on right now, it's running on Gemini Pro, kind of like that mid up midline model. That got 71.8 and GPT-3.5 came in at 70. So Jimmy Apples has been talking about this for quite a bit. He's been hinting that some open sourced models will be coming out that are very powerful and that we'll be seeing some breakthrough in open source that will make it similar to what the OpenAI's models are. He's very cryptic about it, so I don't know if that's true or not, but here on December 6th, he's saying, I'm excited on some open source models coming out soon. And so, of course, that's a day or two before Mistral drops. And so December 8th, for when Mistral dropped, he's saying one of the first open source to come. Then he highlighted this thing, open source MOE mixture of experts coming soon to a cluster near you and this beautiful little multi-headed goat. Thing, representing multiple experts, multiple heads working together. And this is Anton retweeted by Jimmy Apples. Wow, I just reran human eval code bench on the new Mistral 8x7B and it scored 50%. And then, wow, he says, this is higher than Code Llama 34 billion. So on this one, I'm actually not 100% sure if they're using five shot or 10 shot. Basically, that would depend how good the results are. And we have to compare apples to apples. So if they're using, you know, here they're using five shot, meaning they're using five examples to test this. Here, I'm not sure. But if this is indeed five shot and is comparable to the rankings here, on the MMLU, Mistral gets 71.73, making it very competitive with Gemini Pro, that midline model that came out from Google and a little bit better than GPT 3.5. Now, the really interesting thing to me here is, you know, so here's Ilya Sutskover talking about deep mixture of experts in 2014. In 2015, he's recruited by OpenAI and eventually that's where we see GPT 3.5, then we see GPT 4. Was this mixture of experts, was that a big driver for some of their success? I mean, there was a lot of other things that happened at the same time. The transformer architecture was 2016, 2017. So that gave a lot of people kind of like the boost to start building these AI models. The mixture of experts was another one, but assuming they're catching up and the hardware for training these are getting better, faster all the time, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're catching up to GPT-4 in our open source models? Orca2 here finds that these smaller models that are trained on synthetic data, meaning data produced by an AI, GPT-4, produces outputs. Those outputs are given to Orca2. So Orca2 is trained on those outputs. And then Orca2 significantly surpasses models of similar size and attains performance levels similar or better to those models five to 10 times larger. So this seems to suggest that smaller models focus on their own area of expertise. These experts, they're faster, they're cheaper to create. They can be created very effectively with synthetic data. They're really good, better than, you know, as good as models that are five to 10 times larger. And you can put them together in this mixture of experts that then does really well across a wide variety of tasks. Could that have been the secret to GPT-4 success? There's a few different places where you can test out these models side by side. So for example, you can do GPT-3.5 Turbo, the new 1106 version versus Mistral or Claude or Llama or various other ones for the GPT-4s. You do need the Pro subscription, but you can try Mistral, the 7 billion version model of eight experts versus the other Mistral model, the, the 7 billion instruct version. Actually, let's try that. Give me a list of 10 slang terms with definitions.
How would Gladys from the game Portal design a playground for kids? Explain your reasoning step by step. One of the prompts that I really like doing is taking a character from history or a fictional character and asking the AI to write out something that normally that character wouldn't do or would not have talked about, right? So there's no data on that. And actually, I borrowed that from how Microsoft tested GPT-4. They've asked things like, how would Gandhi write a letter about recommending a presidential candidate? And the candidate is an electron, a subatomic particle, right? So it's kind of like takes you a second to kind of like, wait, what? But that's the point. There's no, we don't have any sort of ready to go answer. There's no books that have been written on that subject. So, so Mixtrel talks about, you know, safety first. Gladys would design safety first. Yes, she kept people alive for whatever thousands of years to run through her mazes. She didn't necessarily want them to die. She wanted them to keep them safe. So certainly, yes, safety is a priority efficiency. Totally. So this is starts good. Then it kind of gets a little weird and it says, sorry about the run on sentence. Yeah. So it gets a little weird here. And then educational value, teaching kids about gravity, force, conservation laws, thermodynamics, etc. And then it gets a little bit weird and that's happening with both of them, but that's because it hasn't been properly fine tuned. And actually let me run this against the GPT 3.5 turbo, just so I can show you what I'm talking about. So with those, they've been fine tuned in a way that makes it seem like it's a real back and forth conversation. So these models, they're more like just a stream of consciousness. The fine tuned model is a little bit more like they figure out what's extra and they kind of cut it down to size. But I gotta say like, so far it's really good, right? It answers the question really good and it gets a little nutty, but that's just how, that's sort of like the nature of it before you had a chance to like fine tune it properly. But the answers are good. What would the Doom guy from the video game Doom 2 teach if he was like running a class on time management? So here they both list some uh, time management tips, but maybe kind of miss the point of the assignment. Let me try GPT-4 just to give you an example of what improves when you give it to a better model. All right, so here it's talking about, you know, prioritization and focus, efficiency and speed. Doom guy's efficiency in dealing with enemies would translate into teaching how to perform tasks quickly and efficiently. Stress management, that is true. Physical fitness and stamina, use of technology and tools. Given the advanced technology in Doom 2, he might cover how to use modern tools like apps or time management. See, that that's good because they're, they're, they're drawing connections between the two. So to me, if I was kind of grading this, I would say it's not as good GPT-4, but it seems to be pretty similar to GPT-3.5 Turbo 1106, the, the latest release of it. What would Buddha think about TikTok before he was enlightened and after? So they're saying, well, social media didn't exist back then, but we can speculate. So it does that weird run on sentence thing. But again, I feel like that's going to get worked out. But afterwards, he says, therefore, it's likely that if he encountered TikTok before achieving enlightenment, he might view it as yet another distraction from seeking truth, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, then goes into its thing again. I think it nailed the essence of it. GPT 3.5 as a prince living in luxury and shielded from the suffering of the world. So he was a prince before he was Buddha. He might have seen entertainment and distraction as a common pursuit for those seeking happiness. He might see TikTok as a form of fleeting pleasure. That's really good. It's interesting that both of those answers are really good. They both kind of focus on different parts of the journey, right? So when he was, when he had everything, and then when he went on his quest, on his search, so how would different timelines of that, how if he ran into TikTok at those different points in his life, how he, would he react to it? That's pretty good. And after enlightenment, he would encourage users to reflect on whether their use aligns with principles such as right speech, using words mindfully, and right action, acting with compassion. I'm actually curious what Mr. would say because it ran out of space here, but what would it say about after enlightenment? What, how would Buddha view TikTok then? So he would view it as another distraction from focusing on what really matters. He might encourage people who use social media platforms like TikTok to do so with intention, purposeful matter awareness, rather than aimlessly scrolling through feeds without paying attention. So I'll leave a link to this and several other places where you can maybe play around with Mistral. If you wanted to actually download the actual model and run it yourself, you, you probably can't do it on just on just consumer grade hardware. You're going to have to attach it to some uh, NVIDIA chips in the cloud, but there's a guide for that. I'll link it down below if you're into that. I haven't done that yet, mainly because we are expecting the company to continue releasing the fine-tuned models, the, the more consumer-ready models, the ones that have been kind of fine-tuned to be more closely resembling kind of the outputs that we get from ChatGPT, etc. 
But I got to say, so for myself, I've been viewing the open source race in, in this area with curiosity, but kind of with, with idle curiosity, if I'm honest. I didn't, I wasn't really testing it out. I've tried it here and there. It, it was always a little bit underwhelming. And it makes sense because a lot of it is research. A lot of it's like the bleeding edge of where people are trying to go. And a lot of it is done with a lot less resources and a lot less hardware and, and smaller teams than, you know, OpenAI and Google, et cetera, and DeepMind. But I feel like this is where it starts getting really interesting in the sense that it's getting real. It's catching up. And we're about to see more and more powerful versions of this. Because keep in mind, when they release something that's completely open source, whatever advancements they've made, whatever tricks they figured out how to do with these models, others will see them. They will build on top of it. One of the reasons OpenAI probably stayed at the bleeding edge for so long is because they kept everything hush-hush. Open source pushes that knowledge out. When people see that mixture of experts works really well, they'll take whatever things they figured out and they will add that to their arsenal. And then they'll put that into the open source ecosystem. Hopefully that's the, that's the hope, that's the dream. And so over time, sort of the entire world, because Mistral, they're from France. There's models from the Middle East, from China, from, from all over the world. There are people that are working on this. And if they're publishing the results open source, by the way, Microsoft, with Orca 2, they've also, they made Orca 2 weights publicly available. And as we've seen in that, we have the moat letter that was, you know, they say it was leaked from Google. What they're saying there is that none of these companies actually have a moat. That open source will catch up, they will improve, and they will eventually create better models. Unless these big tech companies figured out ways to maybe potentially prevent that, maybe through the passing of regulation by using the governments to outlaw their competition. I'm not making that statement. I'm saying that's what people are concerned about. Because more and more, I think that letter that said, we have no moat, that rings more and more true. When did GPT-4 come out? So March 14, 2023. So less than a year ago, everyone was using GPT-3.5. And now it seems like something very similar, just as effective, assuming that these numbers are correct. Take this with a grain of salt because we it's only been out two days. We haven't seen the final version. We have to do all this testing. But so far, it's true. It seems like open source caught up in less than 12 months. Here's a letter that got leaked. So I posted it. So that was May 5th, 2023. And here's what they're saying. So this is a, a researcher out of Google. He's saying the uncomfortable truth is we aren't positioned to win this arms race and neither is OpenAI. While we've been squabbling, a third faction has been quietly eating our lunch. I'm talking, of course, about open source. Plainly put, they are lapping us. We have no secret sauce. Our best hope is to learn from and collaborate with what others are doing outside of Google. And we should prioritize, you know, third party integrations, etc. People will not pay for a restricted model when free unrestricted alternatives are comparable in quality. We should consider where our value add really is. So in other words, if you have the choice between paying money for something that lectures you whenever you ask it a question that it deems inappropriate, right? You got to pay for that or a model that will never lecture you about anything unless you ask it to, that will always do its best to output the exact answer to whatever you ask it. And that is free. You know, which one do you choose? Especially if you can see the source code, like right, if there's a code that decides how the the gate, the gating mechanism works, to which expert it routes to, when you can see the, the weights, not that that necessarily tells you anything, but you have visibility into it, right? Which one do you choose? So that I think is the good news for open source. The bad news is, you know, I think more and more of these big companies will start realizing that, you know, publishing papers like this, I mean, here's, here's Ilya Sutzkover published it before he was at OpenAI in 2014. And then years later, maybe, I don't know how this happened, but maybe they, they looked at it. They're like, okay, it's obvious that they figured something out. What were they working on? Oh, here's a paper by Ilya. What is he talking about? Right. They looked at it. They're like, interesting. Could GPT-4 be run like this? Right. And then July 12th, GPT-4 details are leaked. Or I mean, it wasn't leaked in the sense that the actual details were leaked, but somebody went through, kind of reverse engineered a lot of it. And so I did a so I did a video about that. And uh, so one of the chapters was, and this is July 11th, right? So MOE, we talk about mixture of experts and the various papers surrounding that. So might that mean that people in the future will be much more careful not to reveal their results? Will this push everybody to be more secretive, more closed, or will open source be the only way forward? The only way to grow and develop and to stay on the bleeding edge of things, to to sort of take from the hive mind that is humanity, but also, you know, give back whatever you find. We'll see. But definitely something to keep an eye on, because I think that 
we're going to be seeing more and more powerful models that emerge out of this open source world. And while that has certain risks, right? What if somebody publishes a very advanced model for everyone to see, and then some other person or some other group out there figures out how to use it for something evil before anybody else does? You know, that is a fear. That is a real fear. But so is keeping everything closed source that only the privileged few, the people that control the technology and the, the money to build this, that only they have it for safety. That also seems like a that also seems like a risk. So, so I'm certainly rooting for open source to continue to grow and for more and more things in the science community, in this research of AI to be more open, to be more available. And that may in fact be safer than having these weird underground AI labs racing each other to try to get there first and maybe skipping certain safety checks because they think the other guy is getting ahead of them. At the very least here, it's out in the open. But that's it for me. My name is Wes Roth. And if you made this far, thank you for watching.